Fever, 1793, by Laurie Hall Sanderson, Chapter 11, September 7, 1793. Great numbers of the citizens have shut up their houses and fled into the country. Letter of Ebenezer Hazard, Philadelphia, 1793. With only one half-starved horse pulling us all, it took nearly an hour to be clear of the city line. The dry road was rutted from the wagons and the carriages which had fled before us. The insects were vicious. I smacked them on my arms and legs until my skin stung. Grandfather took out his handkerchief and mopped sweat off his face and neck. I waved away a mosquito that buzzed in my ear. It's the smell of that baby, I said. His drawers are full, and it's attracting every bug for miles. Grandfather chuckled. The laughter caught in his throat and made him cough. I watched with alarm as his face reddened. I pounded his back until he raised his arm in protest. I'm fine, child, I'm fine. No need to beat me, census. The farmer turned around in his seat and glared at them. He ain't sick, is he? I'll have not fever victims in my wagon. Take care you don't drive off the road. We're fine back here. Mind your horse, I snapped. Grandfather raised an eyebrow. You're turning into a regular scold, Matty Cook. You sound like your mother, ordering menfolk around. Some menfolk need ordering. That they do. He straightened his legs as best he could between the baskets and clothing bundles. I propose we enjoy our carriage ride in the country. I would, it would hardly be proper to remove my coat, but if I can beg my lady's indulgence, I will fasten a button or two. His stiff fingers fumbled with the pewter buttons until they released and he could breathe with ease. There, he sighed. That's better. It's time to review your soldiering lessons. I groaned. From my crawling days, Grandfather had taught me all the tricks of the American and British armies and quite a few from the French, again and again and again. It would do no good to argue. I was his captive. A soldier needs three things to fight, he continued. He held up three fingers and waited for my response. One, a sturdy pair of boots, I said. Two, a full belly. Three, a decent night's sleep. Grandfather thunked his boots on the floorboards. Hey, protested the farmer. My boots are sound. Grandfather belched. Tisk tisk, said the farmer's wife. Eliza fed me breakfast enough for two blacksmiths. He pulled the brim of his hat over his eyes and settled back against a rolled-up mattress. And now I'm going to get some sleep before our coachman delivers us onto the joys of the Ludington family barnyard and their odiferous pigs. Pigs, echoed King George. I settled in alongside him so my head rested on his chest. The rhythmic turning of the wagon wheels, the hum of insects in the barley fields along the road, and the beat of Grandfather's heart blended into a lullaby. I woke when the wheels stopped turning. I had to shield my eyes from the sun. Why are we stopping, I asked. The farmer didn't answer, but pointed up the road. The baby cried. Four horsemen armed with muskets blocked our way. Robbers. I felt for the small purse in my pocket and nudged Grandfather with my elbow. The farmer let his hand drop to the knife handle, rising up from his boot. The baby welled, and the horse shifted nervously in his, in his traces. The riders advanced. One of the men lifted his hat. Don't be afraid, we mean you no harm. The farmer's hand stayed on the knife. You are entering Pembroke, said a second man. Planning on staying here? Just passing through, said the farmer. I'm taking these folks up to Gwynedd, and the wife and me are heading for her mother's in Bethlehem. We don't have any money, said the farmer's wife. The first man took a piece of paper from under his coat. We aren't highwaymen, ma'am. We have been authorized by the town council to keep out fever victims. I have to ask you to step down so our doctor here can have a look at you. If you aren't sick, you can pass through town. If you are, you'll have to turn around. The farmer jumped to the ground. His wife handed their baby down to him, then hopped into the dust herself. I shook Grandfather to wake him. The doctor examined the little family, peering under their eyelids and looking down into their throats. I shook Grandfather harder. Wake up, I said. There is a doctor who must see us. He didn't move. 
Something twisted inside me. I pinched his nose. Grandfather, I said, my voice louder, please wake up. Grandfather, I said, my voice louder. Is there a problem here, miss? The doctor walked to the side of the wagon. He opened one of Grandfather's eyes with his fingers. Grandfather woke with a start. What in the name of heaven, Grandfather shouted. He broke off into a coughing fit. Water, he croaked. I looked at the men on horseback. Can we have some water, please? We have been traveling in the sun all morning. The men looked at each other and the doctor. Grandfather stopped coughing and leaned back wearily. I'm fine, child. I can wait until we get to the farm. I seem to have contracted a summer gripe. He tried to sit up straighter. No need for further, further delay. Off we go. The doctor stepped back and covered his mouth with his hand. Take this man back to the city, he commanded. He is infected with disease. No, the farmer shouted. One of the horsemen turned his horse and galloped away. Nonsense, Grandfather said. There's nothing wrong. He broke off coughing again. I stared in horror, first at Grandfather, then the doctor. You must help him, I cried. If he is sick, you must help him. The farmer grabbed me under the arms, pulled me from the wagon, and threw me onto the road. He and the doctor lifted Grandfather and deposited him beside me. King George squawked and circled above the commotion. They aren't my family, the farmer said, as he motioned for his wife to climb aboard. They only rode him back the last mile or so. They are walking, and we picked them up. He's lying, I shouted. I don't have no fever, fever, the farmer continued. My wife and baby are healthy. Let me just drive through so I can get to Bethlehem by nightfall. We won't stop for nothing. The doctor nodded to the leader of the group. Go ahead, the man said. Make haste. The farmer brought the whip down with all his strength, and the wagon lurched forward. I stared open-mouthed as the wagon disappeared into a cloud of dust. Our food, our clothing, gone. This couldn't be happening. Go back to Philadelphia, the doctor advised. There are physicians there who will treat you. You can't stay here. We can't walk, I protested. It's miles. Have you no mercy, asked Grandfather. The leader of the group looked down on him. We have to take care of our own, sir. Grandfather glared at the man. I had never seen him so angry. He looked as if he wanted to run the man through with his sword, but he just stared. And I shall look after mine, Grandfather vowed. I shall look after mine.